Welcome to A Life in Film. Support us on Patreon to get early access to episodes. Follow us on TikTok. And if you enjoy this episode, please like and subscribe. Or even write a review. It all makes a huge difference. Thank you. Our guest today is a veteran of stage and screen. He's appeared in dozens of TV shows over the years, from Doctor Who, Bottom, The Crown, Downton Abbey, to Supernatural and 24. One of his first films was The Long Good Friday. Later on in his career, he really hit his stride with a run of successful movies, including Sliding Doors, Entrapment, Johnny English, Valkyrie, and Phantom of the Opera. But he's probably best known for his beloved character, Gibbs, in all five of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, alongside Johnny Depp. Our guest today is Kevin McNally. It's a life and fail. 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 Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, the 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 way I went about this was kind of unusual and it was a bit of a long shot but I messaged you and uh, you actually replied so this is a, a real treat thank you so much for coming on my pleasure I mean your career I mean I, I was obviously aware of you through various things primarily I'm sure you hear all the time Pirates of the Caribbean sure but looking at your CV it's outrageous the amount of credits you've had you outrageous, I mean, uh, uh, outrageous. 168 credits yeah, so they tell me. Yeah, <laughs> does that feel, is that surreal? Does that feel? I mean, can you remember all those jobs? Well, do you know you get to a certain stage where you can't? And I remember once changing agents a number of years ago, and uh, the agent sent me a list of all my credits, and there was one on there, um, and I went, I don't rec, I wasn't in this. You've got this wrong. Can you take it off? And he said, no, you were in it. I said, I can tell you I've never done a half an hour comedy with Joan Collins. I would remember if I have. And uh, two days later, he sent me a video of me in a half an hour <laughs> comedy with Joan Collins. And I, I, I had no <laughs> recollection of it whatsoever. But um, yeah, th- th- I, I am uh, not in any way sort of like cool about all of those credits because I have been asked recently you know what's the thing that you think was the most successful thing you did and I said well it's not a credit it's the fact that I've been able for well next year it'll be 50 years to do the thing that I love doing and not having to do anything else for all of my working life and uh, I wish that upon any actor because um that's the most amazing thing that can happen to anybody. And with none of the bullshit of being, you know, a household name or a, a soap star or having paparazzi chasing you, I live a life of total anonymity and just do the work that I want to do. You just get to play loads of different characters. Get to just, you get just that. Yeah. Act. Well, that's very important, being a character actor rather than, you know, honing your skills to get some sort of image you want to do. Yeah, I mean... You know, what's the next thing I have to do? Oh, great, it's this. How fantastic. <laughs> well, I, I was really annoyed at myself because I saw earlier that you did Lear at the RSC back in 2017. And I, and I uh, the Globe, the Globe Theatre. Was it the Globe, was it? Sorry, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'd missed it and I was a bit annoyed at myself because that must just, just to play that character must just be, um, just must be a surreal experience. I was just stomp around the oh, stage. Oh, God, it was. But I'll tell you, I may not have been the best Lear in the world, but I was certainly the funniest. And you can watch <laughs> You can watch it on the uh, Globe's um, oh, uh, there, website. It? Yeah, they they yeah, they, they, they filmed it, and uh, I, I actually was had to do a, an interview about it the other day. So I watched a little bit of it, and um, yeah, I, I'm very funny. In it the music is fantastic, actually, and the young actors in it are just uh, glorious. It's wonderful, um, and, and and also we made sure that we we made it a very simple. One of the, the one of the tricks of doing Shakespeare is to cut it. So the story gets nice and simple. You know, right. these four or five hour versions of Shakespeare just doesn't hack it with modern audiences. So we got, it, fashion. Yeah, <laughs> we got it, we got it really rectum tight, let me tell you. <laughs> that was cool. That, and that was really recently, so that was 2017. Yeah, four years ago, yeah. It, mm. did, it seems like yesterday, but God, time flies. I um, mean, we don't count the last two years, so it can you know? It's only no, it's, it's only two years ago, exactly. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. 
<laughs> and so, I mean, obviously that's more recent, but how did this whole thing start? Where did the passion come from? Um, well, it's funny you should ask that. I was thinking about that because of the little notes you sent me the other day. And I came from a very, you know, quite impoverished uh, background. And the idea of movies and TV or being involved in that was not, you know, something that I, I thought I could ever get involved in. But an interesting thing happened. My dad used to work for Rover, as it was then, British Leyland, as it would be known now you know jaguar or something or whatever it is now and uh, up to the age of 11 uh, all the kids were invited to a christmas party each year but at the age of 12 uh, they were all sent to a uh, a pantomime in birmingham uh, where i grew up and i remember going and seeing my first pantomime at 12 um and the bright colors and the smell and that there were little binoculars you used to have that you could watch the well, age you put a shilling in in those days and you could watch um, I remember being particularly at that age, being very interested in the chorus girls. Um, so perhaps it's tied in with my own <laughs> development. I don't know. But I remember utterly falling in love and thinking, I would like to stand up there and, and do that. And of course, it, it was still quite a leap, but we had a lot of theatre where I came from back in those days, you know, every city had its own repertory theatre and, and had commercial theatre so it seemed like something I could do so it, it was the love of the theatre really that started for me. I, have, um, I wanted to bring this up at some point I was going to say remind me but actually it's probably quite a good time because I think it was fairly early on in your career and this will be a job that you probably go I don't remember that one <laughs> but um, my dad's a um, he's a cameraman he's retired now but <laughs> He randomly, I was chatting to him and saying, oh, I would have you coming on the uh, podcast. And he was like, I worked with him years ago. He won't remember me because I was a train. He was very young. He was a trainee. And at the time you were very young. You were, I think it was 19, I've written a note here, 1983 to 1984, he reckons. And it was a show called Diana. Do you oh, yes, that one? indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. And he said uh, to me oh, that. Was he on that? Yeah. yeah, and he remembers well, was he, you. Was he a studio cameraman or a film cameraman? Because we used to have uh, two different types of crews in those days. I don't know what he would have been back then. He went on to do film, but I'm not sure. I can't remember what... Um, I, don't, I don't think he actually mentioned that, which one he would have been. But he was very oh, young. He would have been very like a trainee. He would have been like early doors kind of thing. But um, yeah. he was saying he remembers you on that very clearly. Um and he said that, um, you know, this young guy and, and then years later seeing you in Pirates of the Caribbean, like being like, that's that guy who worked with the in the 80s, like years <laughs> later. Um, he's still at it. <laughs> he's still he's still going. Yeah, give, but, give your dad my regards when you see him. Um, I, I'd love to be reminded of who he was. I mean, uh, we probably ended up drunk in a gutter in um, Suffolk somewhere <laughs> yeah that's what he said he said it was in Suffolk <laughs> no very good I just thought I'd mention that because it's um it's no, funny it's how these things cross over because me yeah, and Jake yeah. are both actors and even in our co careers where we haven't been doing it very long it's funny how you work with so many people that even within a few years oh, yeah. um you know you can bump into someone and go I work I work with you but what was it on um, oh, when no, was I've, it? It's so difficult. It, it's yeah, it is. I, I mean, I am fr I frequently embarrass myself because, um, particularly when I work in America, sometimes I say, "What is it we worked on?" And uh, somebody will say, "You've just seen them." I'm <laughs> thinking, you know, and I'm like a like a fan girl over these people, you know. Um, but you, it, it's right, and certainly the times I've been working, um, I will meet. But and sometimes you remember, and sometimes you don't. You know, I remember. <laughs> I remember an actress coming up to me and saying, hi, Kevin, um, have we ever slept together? And I went, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I love how neither of you could remember. <laughs> neither of us could remember. And neither of us cared. You know, it was just all part of the course. Until the 80s came, of course, and it stopped all that nonsense. <laughs> oh, wow, that early on. <laughs> <laughs> Great show. I hope he's so made some <laughs> <laughs> did you um so did you end up going to drama school once you kind of got hooked and wanted to be on stage was it 
Was that your, did you go yeah, to drama school? Yeah, or? I was very lucky that um, when I started out as a 16 year old, um, I, I really wanted to go to the National Youth Theatre. because it was, I didn't think it existed anymore, but my parents couldn't send me. So that year, Birmingham Youth Theatre started and I did that and I got the lead. And, at the, you know, it's all about luck and chance, so much more than talent in many ways. And then my local repertory theatre, had a young actor fall out of a season when there were lots of young parts they wanted to play. And he came to the youth theatre and he gave me my first job in theatre. I then left school and he felt so guilty that he put another actor, you know, out of school and onto the streets that he said, I'll keep you here and you can play parts until you get into a drama school. So in that year, I, I didn't just play the two or three kids he wanted me to play. I would play old men with loads of makeup and I would do all sorts of things. It was a great training. And indeed, he helped me get into RADA. Um, and at that time, it was a two year course. So I had a year's experience as an actor two years training and I came out as a professional at the age of 19. I mean, it's ridiculous, really. I mean, what the hell did I know at 19? You know, I was playing these parts. I, I'd done nothing but act and be very bad at school. So it was, it was too young, really. And a lot of my uh, younger friends who run drama courses and stuff say that nowadays um, they're very keen on life experience. And I think that's a very good idea. I just managed to escape it through longevity, that I managed to keep doing it long enough to actually learn something about what was going on in the world, you know. Mm. Well, it, yeah, it's very true, isn't it? But um, even I look back at my earlier roles and I think, God, it, I don't even know how I managed to do that because you don't really have any experience of, of anything else. It's kind of yeah. nothing to draw on, have you? Um, no. And particularly, you know, if... Um, I touched on this not being, you know, like a, wanting to be a movie star or want to be famous or want to be an actor, then you're a character actor. So you, re you really have to draw upon your life experience. But you can do that by just being observant as you walk around, you know. Take your face out of the phone and have a look at the people on the carriage with you, you know. Do some of that stuff. Yeah, there'll be a bit of people watching and actually observing what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, your friends and the people you know and the people you meet and the heartache they go through and the troubles they face that you don't face so that you have a broader palette. Uh, it's not just your life that you're dealing with. You know, you have an understanding of, of other people's lives. And I also think that you notice that, in, you know, in really good actors that you think you're probably somebody who's quite an empathetic person. You know, you don't judge people or... You don't just go, well, you just screwed your life up. You know, you go, what, why? You know, and you see that person under the bridge. How did you get here? You know, what did the world do to you as well as what did you do? You know, so those things are really important, I think. Definitely. And how did, um, how did the transition out of drama school, was it quite a swift one into jobs? Was it an easy kind of transition or? For me, it was, but this was 19, this was the Christmas 1975 I left and, so at the beginning of 1976, I went with uh, a very old fashioned agent, the sort of people they used to, they used to come up on the train from Brighton with all the TV producers and they all knew each other and they'd go, oh, I've got this young lad, he's just out of drama school, could you put him in one of your TV shows? And of course, at that time, um, television was just full of drama, really cheap, rather crap drama. Um, it wasn't like now, you know, uh, ev everything was drama. There weren't reality shows. There were a few early evening game shows and the, the, the kids shows were earlier on. So I literally, for the first year, went from one TV show to another, really. And, and, and so, you know, yeah, I had the year in theatre learning, had the training, and then just got thrown in front of a camera for a year and just tried to try to pick the job up really a lovely way a lovely way to learn and in fact where i teach a lot nowadays and when when people ask me what advice do you have for me i say to them i've got i can tell you about you know how to work but i can't i can't give you career advice i i wouldn't know how to start in this industry now mm. uh, i wouldn't know how to begin um it seems a very harsh mistress this business now 
Well, I mean, you, you, you two sorry, guys, know, as I'm sure you two guys know. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's I mean, pretty savage out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I would say me and Elliot were saying the other day, like, I mean, even even we were thinking, like, with with all COVID going on, I mean, to actually get an agent now, when you've like, you know, if you've gone to drama school, you've got a bit of a sort of inning, but if you haven't gone to drama school and you're trying, I mean, I dropped out of school at seventeen and sort of worked on building sites and blagged it as much as I could until something started to started to work a bit, and like you right. think kids like and like that. You know, it, it takes its time, but everyone's got their own way of doing things. But I think like with kids now, it's it's difficult because those agents are even less like. I mean, I found like kind of the the most you know some obscure, an obscure agent in the sort of random place, and I thought if I can get a short film through you, then maybe I can sort of start. You know, you just make a start. And I think finding that now and like those sort of trying to get in with an agent when no one knows what you're doing off of a couple of short films or whatever, it's just kind of. It's, it's not. It's not the same way it used to be in that in that respect because everyone's trying to just keep the clients they got, like, and keep everyone at work. Yeah, like, you know. So it's uh, we no, you know, five absolutely. years. And uh, and 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 added to that, um, there you know there is uh, on behalf of the agents, particularly with COVID, you know they're trying to keep up offices. They're all working away from home. There's a cutting back now. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tricky. But you know, I mean your your journey of starting at 17 and, and working on building sites, I mean, I think that's that's as good a start as any, uh, frankly. <laughs> what you know, meeting people and stuff. I think yeah. one of the things that's changed in my life that's come that's gone back full circle, which I don't like, is when I started, I was at the end of a 10-year revolution when working class actors came to the fore, Albert Finney. Um, those and uh, uh, Tom Courtney, all those people, um, and 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 the whole sort of public school thing had gone. That has reverted, I think, because there's very few working class kids now who can afford to go and get a training or to take the time, you know, on mum and dad's money to to go out and you know give it a bash. And I I, I feel very bad about that and, and so I'm very supportive of any uh, body who tr tries to help that in terms of classes a friend of mine Paul McNeely with Bubble and Squeak does it um, any of those people I will support 100% because uh, talent's got nothing to do with your background or, or your family you know no and there's like, I mean I love those I mean my favorites I love the Piro tools and all your Richard Burns and people like that and there's that kind of element of like they really had to hustle to get what they wanted and that's why I like oh yeah I, I mean I think they're amazing and I think that's why they're so good they're so gritty because they had to they had to, they had to have a scrap with it to be able to get what they wanted and, and, like, and, and to be fair when they got it they didn't give a fuck you know <laughs> no, no, some people right. would. <laughs> so and I had the great fortune of working with Peter O'Toole and Richard Harris and I admired Richard Harris immensely and he was a great influence on me as I was I was turning about um I must have been uh in my late 30s and I played a lot of very nice young men and I played you know a few nice characters Diana being one of them and I remember once asking him um to do a play a play by Q Leonard called Da with me and he, 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 was, he was avoiding having the conversation. I said, look, will you do this play with me or not? And he said, Kevin, no, I don't play little men. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's a real decision that you make, you know? And, and I looked back at his career and I went, oh, no, no, you, you don't play little men, do you? You're not interested in playing the little fellow who's henpecked by the wife. You, you play epic people. And uh, so that was his choice. And, and I decided to play quirky, funny people uh, in a, I suppose at that point, I thought, what's my strength? What, what, yeah. what, I, what should I lean towards? Obviously you take whatever job you can get, but can I recognize the ones that'll be really well fitted for me? And uh, that's a good thing to do as well. Kind of get an area where you want your trajectory to be sort of angry. Yeah. Towards. And where you think you'll do well, where you think you'll do well and you'll get noticed, you know? Yeah. So that's the tricky thing isn't it being able to not pigeonhole yourself but at the same time do mm. enough of the same sort of things that people recognize you enough to put you in other things <laughs> yeah, yeah you no know, you're, you're right it, but you've got to be going to do enough of the same things pigeonholing 
it's just mine your strengths and you might find that'll take you somewhere you weren't thinking you were going to go by the way mm-hmm. um and i i certainly um i've been on a run of parts this year it's, it's a perfect example i've gone into them i've been well prepared and i thought this fits me like a glove if i work hard enough and they're all completely different but it fits me like a glove and i feel that with enough preparation i can go on set be relaxed and i can be the person but and for instance i got offered um I got offered a movie the other day, a leading part in a very small budget movie. And I thought, oh, great, a lead in a movie, I'll do it. And I read it and I went, no, don't just do it because of that. that yeah. Nothing resonated in it with me, mm. absolutely nothing. And I thought, no, I'm on a roll here. Don't undermine that now mm. by doing something you could possibly be really shit in because <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not tickling your fancy in any way. But that's for when you get to a certain place where you can make those decisions. Uh, the other hand, uh, somebody once said to me, an actor, when I was young, when a script comes in, say, do you like the part or do you need the money? You know, I mean, th- those are practical things you have to do as well. But there's that, that old quote. I mean, I, I, I've read it in O'Toole's autobiography, but I'm sure it's fucking old, like a little thing that's been said. But it's that kind of no small parts, only small actors thing. It's like, if yeah, you've got no. a part, you might, it might be like a bit like it's sort of on the page of bollocks but if you do your work you can kind of come in and if you like you said about playing your strengths if you can find where you're good and see where you can use that in the character you can still get your little couple of minutes or whatever it is here or there like where you can kind of push it in no absolutely absolutely right and and unfortunately when i teach my kids they they sort of say oh i want more lines and i say you know if you go into a movie with some of these um, big Hollywood stars, which I've had the luck to do, they're usually shedding the lines to other people, you know, because they <laughs> want to act. They don't want to talk a lot. The more you talk in a film, the more you're just filling in the plot. Um, <laughs> what you really want to do is, and, and I always say to them when I'm filming them, I say, my camera's on you the whole time. You know, you could do a speech that long and I might play it off other people. But if in halfway through the speech, you sort of go, at the right moment, you've got you've earned your shot. You know, you're in the movie, so that's uh, that's a very important thing uh, to learn. I think there are no small parts; there are only small actors. I love that. Yeah, and I read that in O'Toole's uh, biography as well. It's just like always stuck with me, like because you know. You know <laughs> well, it's great, isn't it? Great. No, that but, is a, know, that's a great point. People talk about stealing. People talk about people who steal movies. Well, you don't steal a movie by being the lead. You steal the movie by being a small part who is just so good. People remember you from that role, you know. No, definitely. I mean, usually the, as well, the lead roles, I mean, it's great to have a lead role. But then if you're doing that, you usually look at the other characters around you and think, actually, some of these are a bit more interesting or have the better lines or, you know, um, sometimes the yeah. lead can be a bit bland. Absolutely. Uh, that certainly was the case in the first 15 years of my life. Um, it, it, it is absolutely the case for young actors to remember, can, does the part resonate with me? Can I do it well? Does it fit me well? Can I, and if it doesn't fit me, can I reach it? Can I get there? The size of the role is unimportant. Um, to, to the point that you even see, you know, Hollywood film stars plainly attracted by I, I think a great example is um, Tom Cruise in uh, Tropic Thunder. You know, yeah, this, yeah. Is a, this is a ridiculous character role. But he's gone, <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> Why not? I want to do that. Of I mean, there, there are credit, many so. examples of that, you know. Don't he's you think? brilliant in that. Brilliant in that film. He's dancing. I was, I was reading one earlier about, I think, Sandra Bullock and Shannon Tate, another film coming out. It's got uh, Daniel Radcliffe's in it, and he hasn't... I, I'm sure he's been working, but I've not seen anything that he's been doing for a while. Like, he's supposed mm. to be brilliant in it. But um, Brad Pitt jumped on for four days. And I've had just, right. like, you know, I think, like, as a favour of mates or friends or whatever, he uh, he jumped on yeah. for four days, and apparently he was just, just took the whole... Sh- like, Shannon Tate was like, yeah, he just stole the whole show, and we kind of just let him feel like, that's, you know, that's just great. Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes people gives people the beads, but they're like, I'm coming up for four days. And it's, especially when it's a big name or something, they go, well, fuck it, might as well join myself, sort of thing. Absolutely like. do it, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Sort of along with that, um, 
even when you don't get to the you know to the to the place of choice as i always call it um another thing to remember is that you, you can always influence your career I, that five times in my career have i have i thought i'm going in slightly the wrong wrong direction and i phoned my agent saying i'm not doing anything until i do this that you can redirect yourself if you feel you you know you're getting into an area that's not satisfying you anymore or you're playing parts that you don't like and, and one of those was about film actually <clears throat> in the mid 90s I realized I hadn't done a film for 10 years and I thought well I've got to do that and I said to my agent I'm not going to work anymore and I, and, and so I, I, I didn't until there was a film and some friends of mine put me in film Peter Howard put me in sliding doors and um I, I did Spice World, which is bizarre, and 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 then I did a film called Entrapment with Sean Connery and uh, and Catherine Zeta Jones. So by the time Pirates came up, people went, "Oh, he does do films." Mm. Uh, if I if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been on the list to go in for that role. So you know, America wouldn't have happened for me. So you, making decisions is also a thing that you you can do. Wow, that just shows but you. Saying no is a powerful strength that you have, I think. Yeah, it's one of those things that's very hard to do, though. You know, that's um, I, I worked on a on a series um a couple of weeks back, and one of the actors was saying the same thing that during COVID he was kind of really struggling. There was not obviously like for a lot of us, there hasn't been much work, and yeah. um, he was like, oh, you know, that I got offered this film that I just knew wasn't going to be very good and that I wasn't really right for, and he was on the cusp of taking it. And his agent said to him, you don't need to take this. Like, I know you're out of work, but everyone is. Why don't you yeah. just wait? And he did. He waited. And then he ended up getting, even it was just a couple of weeks later, ended up getting a lead in a Ron Howard movie. <laughs> wow. You okay. see? The yeah. On the other you. hand, on the other hand, <laughs> a friend of mine, um, I told him this story about um, well, well, what happened on the on the third part of the Caribbean film. I thought I'm not being paid enough for this, so I'm going to hold out for more money, like a like a decent uh, wage. And all sorts of shenanigans went on, but I got the money. It was great. And a friend of mine phoned me and said, "I heard you tell that story." And he said, "I've been offered this film, but um, they're not offering me enough money." And I think I'm going to do what you did. And I went, "Yeah, do that, do that," you know. And uh, he phoned me back two weeks later and said, I did what you said. I said, what happened? He said, they told me to fuck off. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I felt really guilty. <laughs> Things around about us. Be prepared. you really got to be prepared to lose the job if you want to do yeah. something. Like, you know. Yeah, you won't go balls deep if you're going to go in sort of thing. Balls deep? Was that the <laughs> yeah. thing? It was, yeah. Did you just <laughs> say that? Say, one I should be using all over Christmas. I'm going balls deep in the turkey. No, that doesn't work. No, that's... <laughs> Oh God! There's there's the line <laughs> above the podcast. There's the quote. Yeah. Oh, dear. All steep in the turkey. Yeah. Mm. But I mean, I guess it must have helped that you'd done two pirates films before that, so you had a kind of you know. You yes, had I think it... that was the bit he missed, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was the bit I missed when <laughs> when I gave him the advice to go fuck you. I'll have as much money as I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> So was this, it was obviously not a sequel for him. This was just a, it was a film and, and then he, um, yeah, yeah, it was uh, a film. Oh, I no. should have told him to do it on the second film. But, yeah. so how, how was the, um, I mean, obviously working up to when you left drama school and you went in and did a lot of TV and everything else. And you say you were doing a lot of dramas. Um, what with the move to Hollywood and to actually like end up doing the pirates films. And obviously you say you did the Spice Girls movie, absolute banger. Um, and Entrapment, great film. They're all like classics and they're films that people know and love. How was it? Do you reckon it was that that change that you made when you said to your agent, I haven't done a film for a while. Let's hold out. Do you really? Yeah, like, no, was I, that I, the I, moment. You know, the, the, um, a very crude way of putting the business is there's lists and I wasn't on the movie lists. So I realized that I, I, I mean, I was, I just turned 40 actually. Um, I, and I was in the theater looking in the mirror, putting on my makeup, thinking, oh God, I'll never be on a back line in Hollywood now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I really, I, I've got a few years to get back on the list of being somebody who does movies, even though I'd done many in the 70s and the 80s. For some reason, things took over. I, I wasn't doing them in the 90s. And, um, so yeah, I think you have to be aware of that, probably even more so now than I 
was then. Do you um, think you still can dip between theatre and film in this? In there's under probably not in the same way, but like, do you think you can still as an actor do that if you want to? Kind of be like, if you know, especially when you're on like where you're at, like if you like that kind of being able to go and do something in the West End and then still feel like you can come out and people are going to be bringing you in for films. Like, do you think that's still maybe as an actor kind of like coming up now? Do you think that's still a possibility if you're getting a good trajectory to be able to sort of balance it now? Do you think, yeah, be, you de uh, no, definitely because th that th theater is still where casting directors go to discover new talent, you know. Right. Um, uh, and any decent casting director I know will say, I saw someone brilliant in this thing that I, I'm going to get them in, you know. Yeah. So it's definitely still a route. It's not the route that it used to be. But, yeah, it's definitely something. Um, and, and, and I would also say, because of that, uh, because you've got a lean into getting as much as you can out of each job just never be lazy okay never go oh well, this is just a somebody might you know if you do a good job somebody somewhere might see it and go wow they'd be really good for this thing that i'm doing so every job every job is more is really important in the way that it wasn't when i started out i was able to go out and make a complete shambles of something i did and it wouldn't harm me in the way it it would now, I think. I think that's, a little more talking to younger actor friends, uh, that's what I, that's what I come to believe. Yeah, mm. it's funny. You probably it? know I more had, about that um, than me. I was just going to say that um, I had a. I mean, it was just a short film, but I got a call from my agent saying, "Oh, there's a short. This director wants you to be in the short film." I was like, okay, cool. And I, I spoke to him, and he was like, "Oh, yeah." So I am. Um, and I was thinking, oh, maybe he's seen one of my films or he's seen something that I've been in. And he was like, oh, you were on, um, my friend does a podcast called The 98%. And it's about, obviously, the 98% of actors that are out of work and, you know, similar sort of podcast to this. And I just went on there to chat with her and to talk about, you know, you know, acting and everything else. And he'd heard that and then was like, oh, this guy seems, seems like a nice guy. We'll, um, we'll have a look and see what he's done. And then that made him look at my IMDb and... And you there think, you go. That is a random way for someone to get a job. But that's the it. falling cards. That's that's mm. how it happens. That's that's how you know the butterfly stroke. Uh, will you know that that old physics thing of you know a, a butterfly uh, wing can cause a huge effect across the yeah. other side of the planet and cause a tsunami. You know that 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 from from little things, bigger things can grow. Mm -hmm. Anything you do, do to the best of your ability, because yeah. who knows who's going to see it. You never know. You never know. You never know. And, and I mean, we... this podcast tonight, I might even get a decent, decent part this year. You never know. Yeah, I was going to say. Might <laughs> see it and go, oh, we'll have him. Uh, we'll have him as a latex-covered guy in the next Star Wars film, because that's my <laughs> ambition. And it'll be your new niche. <laughs> my niche, yes. I've even been practicing the latex covered Star Wars character I'm going to do. Do you want to hear the voice? I moved off to. There we are. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> there you go. I've, That's I've the been job practicing for 20 right years. Okay. Bring <laughs> <laughs> it, fingers crossed. I mean, they Thank seem you. to be making a Star Wars film every year. This could so, be yeah, it. You never know. Somebody go, oh, so we've run out of actors now. in Star Wars. Well, have you seen this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. You never know. And can we delve into, I mean, me and Jake are real fangirls when it comes to Pirates of the Caribbean. It's a thing that, you know, we were both brought up on and, yeah, and through the years have really enjoyed. I mean, right. how... What can we just get a little insight into what that was like? I mean, did you realize when you got the call that you were going to be in it that it was going to be what it became? No, I mean, uh, I well, I've told the stories many times, but maybe your guys haven't heard it. I, I had been going up for American movies for about 20 years and never getting them. Um, and I remember going up for Spider Man to play uh, the part that, um, I don't know, some actor got and and getting off the bus and going home thinking i can't waste my time like this anymore and i remember thinking oh i bet um this guy will get it and that guy got it um so i was in my garden uh, on my birthday uh, getting slightly merry with some friends and a friend said to me um uh, 
aren't you supposed to be at an audition today? And I said, yeah, but it's for an American movie. I keep going out for them and I never get them. It's just a waste of my time. She said, no, go on. I think you should go. You never know. It's a, you know, it's a ticket in the lottery. I said, well, I've been drinking now. I'm a bit pissed. And she said, well, it's for a pirate, isn't it? I don't think it matters how pissed you are. <laughs> so I said, all right. She said, I'll drive you in. She didn't drink. So uh, I went in and uh, the next day I got offered the part. And I thought, oh, I finally got one. It's great. But I thought, it's a film about a ride in Disneyland. This is just going to be, this is just going to go into the bargain bucket video, you know, the DVD thing. And as I, but, but then I found out that Johnny Depp and Jeffrey Rush were doing, and I thought, well, they know more about films than me. Maybe they're onto something. And the funny thing was my daughter in 1999 had had an operation on her head and couldn't fly. So I took her, for the summer holidays to Disneyland Paris. And when I was filming the first pirate film, I phoned her up and I said, do you know, this, it all seems very familiar to me. I don't know why. And she said, dad, did, you took me on Pirates of the Caribbean ride four times in Paris. And I went, <laughs> oh, that's where I've seen all this before. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a feeling that it might, you know, because of Johnny and Jeffrey getting involved, no one could have predicted that within weeks of it opening, it was, well, for a while there, it was the biggest opening film ever in history. Wow. And, and then the rest is history. I mean, you know, 20 years later, I've done five of them. And I have to endlessly talk on social media about how the fact I don't know if there's a sixth one. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, it's been an extraordinary part of my life. And it did open America up to me when I was in my late 40s, you know, so it was terrific. I, I wish it nothing but well. Amazing. And that, I mean, that's an incredible story as well, because I know that I, you know, sometimes when you go for something, you just think this is literally like get, buying a lottery ticket. You just think the chances of getting this one and and so nearly you didn't go for it so that i mean wow, i know it's crazy. So nearly didn't go for it so let that be a lesson to you yeah yeah but it's also it. led to, to wonderful things over the 20 years because each generation finds those films like they find star wars mm. um i have some wonderful memories i remember being in a bar in washington dc um, and somebody came up and saying, are, are you Mr. Gibson, Pirates of the Caribbean? And I said, yes, I am. They said, we have a friend, it's his 25th birthday upstairs. Would you please come and say hello? And the next thing I knew, I was standing for pictures with five, six feet Brazilian models. And I was having the most extraordinary <laughs> time. And it was just great to delve into their world. And, and then on a more serious note, I was at a... Um, a convention in Toulouse recently and a woman came up to me and said I just want you know she said I had the most dreadful childhood and where I went to hide from it was Pirates of the Caribbean thank you and I was just in floods I was just in floods because there are men and, and actually I've been told stories like that before people who you know whose childhoods maybe weren't that great and found great refuge in in the fantasy of pirates just like a generation before found refuge in the fantasy of star wars so i feel happy uh, honored and privileged to have been a part of that in many people's lives they're iconic aren't they they're, as you say yeah. it is up there with star wars and the fact that it's i mean it's one of those things like you say I mean, they could make another one next year. Um, it feels like it could happen. Um, I heard that they're doing an all-female version of it, but I don't know if that's still a thing. But um, I can't I don't imagine they so. could do it without uh, Johnny Depp. Uh, I don't think so. I, the problem is, is that social media has taken over a rationality. And so most of the things that people ask me, I say, yeah, I've seen all that on social media. I haven't heard anything like that from the studio or from the actors or for any of the creators involved. So I, I don't know. I think it's sort of in a state of um, hiatus. I must tell you a funny story, actually, about spin-offs and all-female. Is I was making the third one, and I and I um, was for reasons of my own. I went to the Hustler store in Los Angeles, which, as you know, is a sort of a soft porn magazine, but it has this shop that does all sorts of fun things in there. And I went in, and there were loads of cameras being set up. And I was making a pirate film, so I looked like Mr. Gibbs. 
And I realized they were having um, a premiere of a film that was called, I don't know, it was something like Prostitutes of the Caribbean or something. It was a porn version of Pirates. <laughs> and I went up to the girl at the, th I said, can you get me out of here? Because if I'm seen in a photograph, <laughs> any of this, my career is over. <laughs> and they hustled me out of the back of Hustler <laughs> and got me in a taxi and sent me off. It was such a close call, but the story can be told now. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> amazing. It's long yeah. enough ago that you can mention it without being arrested. <laughs> yeah, or, or without being cancelled. <laughs> so, oh, my God, that's I amazing. I wasn't in the film. I never said I was in the film. That's what happened. I saw I'm going to scour the internet now and see if I can find a picture of you in this store. <laughs> <laughs> I think they saved me and got me out in time. It was good. I've, well, I've got my fingers crossed that there there will be another Pirates of the Caribbean because I just love. I mean, so the character my of Jack Batman. Sparrow is just yeah. iconic. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I have a confession. Um, yeah. My twenty fourth birthday, and it was like lockdown at the time because it's in the start of January, and I had a bottle of rum, and I thought it would be a fine idea. And um, the the mother to my child at the time did not enjoy this experience because I've made her watch all five of the Pirates of the Caribbean films back to back while I drank my bottle of rum. I'm a terrible person, naturally, but like, I mean, <laughs> really are. I really, <laughs> it was, uh, and I, I, I did do that. It was, a, it was a matter of nostalgia, and Elliot winds me up about it to this day. That was how I spent my 24th birthday. So that was, uh, that was a good one. <laughs> Which wasn't even very long ago, was it, Jay? No, it was <laughs> last year. Can I, can I, let me, I, I want to show you something. Will you wait for two seconds? Yeah, of course. That's funny. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm back. Hello. I had my 59th birthday in Australia six years ago. And uh, there was a little local restaurant, wonderful bunch of people. And I said, can I have it here? And they said, yeah, and we'll make it pirate themed. And they produced this, of which I have kept and will never be drunk by anybody, especially not you, Jake. Um, <laughs> they made these, and I will keep this for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. Mr. Gibbs, last drop, established 1956. That's and that amazing. is a, a very special rum blend. And occasionally I see my 26-year-old son looking very thirsty and I, I hide this <laughs> because I never, ever wanted drunk and I want it to go down from generation to generation. But isn't that a lovely That's thing? Amazing. That's brilliant. Amazing. Wow. Excellent. I was wondering, I was like, what's he going to bring out here? <laughs> but I suppose yeah. little things like that must make, like, when you when you look at those films and you look at like things like that, just like someone making a rum for you, for like, over your bed, like, you've oh, you got to make little things that work. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> lovely it really is and um you know i do a lot of conventions and stuff and you know people come and i sign autographs for them and the little paintings that they do or the little things that they make like that they'll make you know aztec gold or they'll um, in fact i can i can show you <laughs> this is extraordinary i went to um uh chile and um you know they're all cowboys in chile and this girl came to me and she gave me this. It's a child's cowboy boot. <laughs> this painting on it that she did. Isn't that extraordinary? That oh, no, happened. it wasn't chilly. It was uh, Cheyenne. I'm sorry. I got the wrong one. But so I, I, the, my wife hates it. My, the, the whole house is, is full of, of Mr. Gibbs memorabilia that people uh, give. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's incredible. I have yeah. to ask as well, this is a complete change of gear, but um, I noticed you had, and it may be a small role, but the fact that you were a part of the Long Good Friday is oh. is pretty incredible. That's, I mean, that's one oh. of the iconic British gangster movies. I um, know, I, I know. It was a, a brilliant thing, but the funny thing was, is <laughs> when I did that, um, I, I don't know if you know, but um, it's it's a, it's an icon. People come up to me and say, oh, "You were the Irish youth in in, in that the, the rent boy in that." And uh, for years, I went. Yes, apparently I was because I had a girlfriend who could not get out of the house and get anywhere on time. And I went to the premiere of it, and uh, I missed 
my bit because it's before the titles. And then it got re-released and I had another very, very tardy girlfriend and I missed it again. And I didn't see it till 2011. <laughs> <laughs> oh, at, 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 the, at the South, uh, what was it, the South End Film Festival? I didn't see it till then, and uh, and that was weird. Watching myself at the age of twenty-two or whatever it was, um, being picked up by Paul Freeman and then shot in the head—that was good. Not a bad, not a bad little role to have That's so early film. on in your career. Well, you know, it's funny. There are a lot. I've got to take my wife out to do it in a minute. Um, it, it's funny. There are some of the smallest roles like that. Are the most iconic. There's Mr. Sex from Bottom um, that people. Uh, yes. That Is it possible? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and another one. one this later. Another one is uh, Phoebe Waller Bridges, a great friend of mine. She asked me if I would come along in Fleabag and be the old guy who makes love to love to her, going, "You're so young, you're so young, you're so young," and <laughs> it's it's literally a few moments. Um, uh, but the amount of people who go. You're so young, you're so young, you're so young. It's those tiny little bits <laughs> in, in iconic programs that people really remember, you know, it's yeah. great. Yeah. 100%. I will, yeah. um, this has been amazing, and I will obviously let you go so you can have dinner with your wife, but I want to ask yeah. you before you do um, two things. One thing, I mean, it's important for all people, actors, crew members, production, when they're coming into the industry and they're trying to sort of figure out how they're going to survive um you know there is a lot of downtime um and it's something that i didn't realize until i started doing this and i was like you know expecting mm. to be working non-stop do you have like is there a coping mechanism you have or some a, a hobby that keeps you busy you know in the downtime well you know one of the things that you have to avoid is spending too much time on social media um my advice is this you will have a lot of downtime Take a pencil and a pad and start creating stuff for yourself. Uh, even if it doesn't get anywhere, the creativity it creates in your mind will help you. It's like doing bench, pre bench presses if you want to look buff. You know, you have to keep your mind working. And particularly as we get older, we have to keep it working. So I'm constantly thinking of of creative projects and it's a job that you get paid for they feed you you've got somewhere to lie down make the best use of that time and don't you know waste it liking cats <laughs> I that's would. solid advice solid advice uh, and the I last thing yeah. Sorry, go on, go on, Jake. No, what you can say? I was just saying, I found out I got to about 22 and I realized that I was like, I, I had the same realization, like, oh, I'm not working all the time. So I had like three little jobs in a row, and then I was like, unemployed for a year. And I was like, shit, that's how it is. And I started painting. And I find that's a good, like, oh. that kind of just keeping your brain looking at things that aren't like, you know, and thinking about, you know, just being in touch with yourself is like the best. As long as you're doing something, whether it's like your work, like whether you're writing or painting or something like that you're always kind of painting just... very good drawing um i do a lot of that um, yeah I, in 2012 i was working a lot but i had big gaps in between so i didn't need to work i wrote a novel that's what i did and it's coming <laughs> out in march uh, it's a comedy oh, sci-fi novel um, oh, really? that's what actors can do because you literally you can have a successful career and literally have half your career uh, half your year free so mm -hmm. Use it well, you must. What's the book called? We'll plug it. <laughs> it's called Sons of Soul, and it's coming out in March, and it's a science fiction, comedy science fiction novel. Very good. I'm looking forward to hearing about that one. That sounds awesome, man. Um, and last thing, last but not least, um, it's a bit of a tradition to have, you know, if you have a moment that you can recollect from your career that was utterly humiliating, perhaps a moment of, you know, being on stage naked, not knowing your lines type scenario. Um, is there anything that jumps to mind? Farting on stage very, very loud while naked. Yeah. <laughs> is that it was a really, true? really bad one because nobody could hide the fact that I died. And... Uh, the, the people just standing naked on a stage with 500 people laughing at you <laughs> with you is um is very very bad wow that was like really on the nose with my <laughs> well, with my description it felt like uh 
it's a perfect example of what that was about. Yeah. Yeah. thank you very much kevin this has been wicked yeah. and thanks so much for replying to me and um being a good sport and coming on here and having a chat i really appreciate it it's been my pleasure boys thank um, you so much good luck i'll see you later yes okay. thank you very much i'll send it all over right. soon when it's all edited and you can have a little look at it thank you that'd be lovely okay. cheers man thank you well, nice, guys. thank you very much good Bye. Night, thank ma. you Thank you to our guest, Kevin. Kevin's comedy science fiction novel, Sons of Soul, is out in March. We're a small independent podcast, and we're now on Patreon. So if you would like to get episodes early, amongst other bonuses, we would hugely appreciate your support and word of mouth. Thank you. We hope we carry a positive message to those of you starting out, those of you who are veterans in the industry, and those of you who are simply fascinated by film. For any questions, requests, please email lifeinfilmpodcast at googlemail.com. Thank you. It's a life in film. 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 And you better come back next month to a life in film. To a life in film. Oh.